So this section of the, uh, of the morning is going to be our product service systems. Um, it, it is slightly separate from the, the other uh, topics we've been talking about today, which really relate to openness. But the reason why I think product service systems fits here is because it's all about a reconfiguration of your design and business model, which is a bit like uh, crowdsourcing, open innovation, and open design. Uh, a lot of this uh, material, in fact, most of it, is for, was produced in the Proteus project run by Tim McAloo. Um, a lot of the, the work and the research developed behind this is from, uh, produced by Tim, but also um, by colleagues, uh, Christina Mugard and Nikki Bai. So I'll, I'll start off with asking the question, what is a product? No suggestions? Go ahead. It's probably something that's um, tangible or material. Something tangible or material. Anybody else? What, any objections to that? Go ahead. I was thinking it can also be like a, a computer program that you jump on from the internet, but it's not something tangible. That's a good point. Software. So perhaps it's not something that's tangible. Um, Got the back there. Okay. So it's about point of activation. Service happens instantly for you, whereas uh, during use, whereas the product can lay dormant for a while. Okay, that's a good way to distinguish between the two. Like and in exchange for money. Okay, isn't that isn't that the same as a service? Yeah, it's a service, same as a product. It's a product. Okay, so I mean, is that's a good way to describe the catch-all term, which we'll call an offering. So an offering can be a product or a service, and it's something that somebody would like. But in terms of distinguishing between a product and a service. Can anyone do it? <coughs> I mean, there was a, a, some distinction over there on points of activation. I was just thinking that a uh, service is something where somebody has to continuously attribute to the service, where a product is like a one-time um, exchange between somebody. OK. <laughs> so there's the exchange element uh, there, which is a really important concept of it. Uh, would you like to one last input? I'll just say the, the service, the customer is interacting with you immediately at a point, but it isn't like that with product. Okay. And that's quite a very similar point to the gentleman back there made uh, the point of activation in a service. Uh, it's in interacting with you when you need it, when you're using it, whereas the product can lay dormant. Go on, if you'd like to come back. Uh, that's a good point. I mean, it could be, it could be the human interaction aspect to it. Um, now, of course, there's no real right or wrong answer here, but um, the one that um, Tim and the Protis group have found most useful is to distinguish them like this um, by saying the difference between a product and a service really is the transaction which transfers ownership. So in a product, you transfer ownership of the product to the uh, customer. So all of a sudden, that, that thing that you're that offering is no longer responsibility of the producing company. It's now the responsibility of the customer. Whereas the service, the ownership doesn't transfer necessarily. In a service, it's still the responsibility of the supplying company all the way through. Does everyone buy that definition? Or anyone have any problems with it? Now, sometimes these definitions, they're 
they're created for a specific purpose. And the reason we've defined product and service in this way is it helps us to think about how to reconfigure the business models. So what is a product service system? Hands up if you've heard of a product service system. Would you like to give me a uh, definition of what you think a product service system is? Yeah. You? Uh, if I remember it correctly, it is where you buy a product and then uh, it's, you have some sort of a uh, correspondence with the company providing you a service, for example, the I think it's the Rolls Royce motors of airplanes, yeah. where they buy the motors and then the, the, they say we will give you at least five hundred thousand whatever air hours, and then we will if, if something fails, we will provide a, a service for repairs or whatever <coughs> spares or what, what you need for the for the for the engine to keep running. Okay. We'll, we'll come to the Rolls Royce case in a bit, um, but yeah, that's a, a very classic example. Um, but just touching on the first point you made, it's the, um, the continued interaction with the selling company and the customer. So it doesn't stop at the point of product sale. So if we look at the traditional product development model, it's develop the product, produce the product, and then it's sold to the customer. Whereas uh, in the product service system, we hope to develop the product, sell it, and then also generate revenue throughout the product's life and throughout the customer's activities in the form of a service. And I think it was Moens who suggested uh, the service only exists when the product is being used, something that these two gentlemen uh, suggest in their definition. So what is a PSS? As we said a moment ago, the traditional model only takes uh, product development up to the point of sales and then transfers ownership over to the customer. Whereas in a PSS, we also have interaction with the customer throughout these use phases. So there's traditional uh, producer ownership, revenue generated at point of sale, and then traditional customer ownership up to disposal. And this is, um, oh yeah, that's the uh, producer's responsibility and liability. Whereas in a PSS model, the idea is we can generate revenue all the way through the product's life cycle and the customer's use of it. So it might not be that we have to sacrifice the product sale, but it might be we displace the, the money we make on the product sale with service, or it might be additional revenue. So we might still sell the product for a similar price, but make additional revenue at these various stages of the product life cycle. Oh, and also disposal, I've added here. So the PSS business strategy, PSS means making a shift of business focus from a business based on value creation through the transfer of product ownership and responsibility, changing to a business based on value creation through the support and delivery of a service from a product for the whole of its lifetime. Here's the Rolls-Royce case. Would you like to present it? Yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, just to pick up on a couple of the points you suggested there, it's not quite um, a product service system in the way that uh, you suggested. Rolls-Royce made the, the fundamental leap uh, to say, instead of producing turbojet engines now, we're going to produce power by the hour. So no longer are we just going to sell our engines to the customers. We're going to sell um, performance. So now the customers receive basically pay for how much thrust they get. So if the plane flies a certain distance, they play, pay for however far uh, that plane has fly, uh, flown using these engines. And what was the benefit of that? What, can anyone suggest why Rolls-Royce thought this was a better model for them? Go out the front. Probably because some of their larger engines uh, will then be sold for the larger flies and they could uh, actually uh, also afterwards uh, sell 
plants so that they can have these. Yeah. Why would these larger engines be sold for larger flights in this model as opposed to the previous? Because uh, instead of just having a motor that can do the thing, they would now have the they would choose for uh, the distance and the lifetime of the flight. Okay, that's a good point. Out the back. So they'll, they'll, they'll create revenue in the entire lifespan of the engine, and they'll ensure that all the spare parts, they'll, they'll also, of course, drive all the spare parts, they'll also make revenue on that. They'll make revenue on the, of course, the internal revenue on the, on the technicians being sent out and etc. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're getting the gist of a uh, product service system there. Uh, so, that, yeah, they can generate revenue, but what's really fundamentally important for uh, Rolls-Royce was, it's a high technology uh, industry. Um, so it was very important for them to be able to assess the performance of their product during its life. So by running a product service system, they still had ownership of their product. Therefore, they were able to maintain it whenever they wanted to or whenever they saw fit. And they were also able to use sort of diagnosis systems on it. So it basically meant that they could monitor how well their products were performing so that they could make design improvements for the next phase. So that was one of the main incentives for doing it. Sorry, would you like to come back on that? Okay. Uh, here's an example by Dan Foss. Um, they've moved from producing and selling electronic refrigeration controls to producing cooling in supermarkets. Um, and the reason they did this was because they didn't want to be reduced to be just component suppliers. They thought that would be a, a highly strangled competitive market where they wouldn't make much margins. So they needed to provide something extra, some extra knowledge. Um, if we can see a, a typical refrigeration scenario here, Danfoss will provide uh, these thermostats, for example. And in a typical refrigeration situation, the immense quality of some of these thermostats may have very little impact on this refrigeration setting, depending on walkways, uh, ambient temperature, number of windows, ventilation units, air conditioning. All these things have a much greater impact, perhaps, than the quality of the thermostat. So it was important to, for Danfoss to think about it in its, in its use situation and provide that service element to its product. Xerox is the, uh, the classic uh, case for all product developers. Uh, they've turned from photocopying machines to document services. In other words, again, they can monitor and maintain their, their photocopying uh, facilities, but also provide paper supplies and ink. So they're basically making revenue throughout the use of their photocopiers. Also, particularly important for Xerox, is they get constant customer contact. So instead of just selling a product and then that's it, they have no contact with the customer again, they're constantly in contact with their customers, which is a really fundamentally important thing, particularly for companies like Xerox. Oh no. Um, are still in? Anyone help me out? Ostrilner. Again? Ostrilner. Ostrilner. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> these are organic food producers. Um, and basically, they, they realized that it, it was actually quite difficult and hard work to be um, organic in terms of uh, buying your food. So they had to give greater incentive to the, uh, the customers and made it much easier for them by providing organic food delivery services. So they were adding on that service element as an incentive to their customers to go down this organic food route. Dow Egberts, coffee machines. Now, you've probably seen uh, coffee machines. We have one in our, our kitchen for our offices. Dow Egberts provide all the service for that machine. They supply the coffee. Um, they come and service it once in a while to make sure it's maintained properly, and we just pay them a subscription rate. So instead of selling coffee and selling a machine, they've got constant revenue from these services and constant customer contact. Oh, 
IBM, from computers to consultant services. So previously where they would just sell computers to people who didn't know what they were necessarily buying, uh, now they sell consulting services to let uh, the customer know what exactly they need and what specifications do they really require. DuPont, from paint to painted cars. And EasyJet. Who would say EasyJet is a PSS solution? Who would say EasyJet provides service? Who would say they don't provide service? Why do you say that? Service sort of way to provide a service, but they don't provide a lot of service when you've actually bought a product from them. So, is there <laughs> no service? No, no, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I put here EasyJet perhaps is more renowned for its lack of service or no frills approach to service. That's what it's known for. On board, you get no service provided. Um, but in a product service sense, they did provide a service, they did do something unique. They realized lots of airlines were basically providing a complementary service. They weren't really getting the revenue from the complementary services provided. So EasyJet decided, let's strip that out completely and give the customers what they want, which is better value or lower costs. Then they provided the really fundamentally important service, which was utilizing online web booking. So they provided a booking service with the clients Whereas previously, all other airlines, you had to go to a travel agent to book your flights for you. And because they skipped out that third party, that middleman, they were able to dramatically reduce the costs. So they provided a, a small service cutting out a middleman, which really was translated to extra value um, for the customers. So in your teams, what I'd like you to do is discuss the following scenario for the next five or so minutes. Uh, you have been developing and selling microwave ovens for many years, and I've seen profits steadily falling due to increased competition. Uh, how could you, how could you did? How could you, <laughs> how could you add a service dimension to your business, and what market segment would you target? <laughs> 